West Virginia is a special place. People of the state that have great pride in this WB logo. And you'll stop in the Golden Blue. It is a great night to be a Mountaineer wherever you may be. And now it's the show brought to you by Mountaineer fans for Mountaineer fans. The Country Roads Webcast. What's going on, Mountaineer Nation? Welcome into episode 180 of the CRW Podcast here for our Oklahoma Review and Reaction. This one unfortunately coming after the worst loss of the season. West Virginia dominated in Norman in what may be their final attempt there to beat the Sooners at their place. West Virginia falling 59-20 to in the 10th game of the 2023 WVU football season. And we're going to break down what went wrong, kind of provide my takeaways before we get into a stat review of the game and then of course take a look around the big 12 so it should be a fun episode here despite the loss from west virginia we have some fun things to talk about here on the country roads webcast and we're excited to bring it to you so with no further ado let's get into it here on episode 180 of the crw podcast All right, Mountaineer Nation, leading off episode 180 here. Just kind of want to get into my takeaways from the game. I know it's one that we don't want to talk about too much, obviously, when West Virginia suffers a 39-point defeat and has you know their worst game of the season at the worst possible time. And that's kind of what it all boils down to for me, is that it was one of those situations kind of where everything that could go wrong did go wrong, and it went wrong at the worst possible time, as this was, you know, maybe the most important game of the season for West Virginia, as they were looking to potentially stay within striking distance of reaching the Big 12 title game, but those hopes are now officially dashed, unfortunately, after this loss to Oklahoma, where, like I said, everything that could go wrong did go wrong, and we're going to talk about some of those things that did go wrong, and I know it's a 39-point loss, but actually West Virginia had opportunities in this game to keep it close and, you know, have it be a shootout throughout this game as it kind of started off, realized that it was kind of trending that way. That's something I mentioned on the preview podcast here that I feared this was the most talented offense that West Virginia had faced in terms of skill position talent, especially at the wide receiver spot since they played Houston. And I knew Oklahoma, if they tried to spread West Virginia out, it would probably create some matchup concerns. Unfortunately, that's exactly what they did. And West Virginia's offense was going to need to, you know, keep withstanding that and answering that call and scoring back. And unfortunately for the Mountaineers, they weren't able to do that. They had a really bad sequence in this game where they had five straight three and outs that ultimately kind of decided things. So that's obviously a very important sequence, but there were some other ones that I think, you know, probably haven't been looked at as much that we're going to try and hone in on here that I think really affected this game a little bit. And the first one of those being um, West Virginia obviously had a great opening drive to get up 7 nothing, and, you know, want to commend that because there's not too many positives we're going to be talking about, obviously, when you lose a game by 39 points. But one of those we can talk about is West Virginia for the third straight game has found a way to score on their opening possession. Earlier in the season, it was something that was a problem, was getting off to slow starts in games. They found a way to alleviate that. Unfortunately, in this game, they weren't able to continue it and replicate it, but they did get a good drive, and it was a good drive in terms of not only getting the score, but you also took off a good amount of time off the clock, which is what you needed to do in this game, was try and keep that Oklahoma offense off the field. West Virginia will ultimately fail with that goal, but early on in this first drive, they achieved it, used up four minutes of game time, had some good play calls, and had a successful touchdown drive to jump off to the opening lead over Oklahoma, the only lead that West Virginia 
would have in this contest, unfortunately, as when I'm kind of looking back at my notes on Oklahoma's next possession is when I get to the first kind of play that I think potentially had an effect on this game, just judging by the way that it turned out. Um, And that is West Virginia, you know, on defense. And it looks like they're actually got Oklahoma, you know, in a good spot. They've got them, you know, a little bit behind the chains. And here comes Marcus Floyd on a blitz, and he's almost got Dylan Gabriel dead to rights, it looks like. And somehow Dylan Gabriel avoids the Marcus Floyd sack. And when West Virginia obviously blitzed and you don't get home, then that's going to be trouble. Either the quarterback's going to take off on you, get downfield on his own, or he's going to have enough time to find someone open. And that's unfortunately what happened on this one. And it was a big play for Oklahoma, 22-yard pass to Stogner. Whereas if Marcus Floyd makes that sack, West Virginia has a chance to get the ball back without Oklahoma scoring there, get the ball back up 7 nothing after taking some time off the clock in their opening drive. So Dylan Gabriel avoiding that sack and West Virginia not getting that sack, I think when you look at the flow of this game, that was kind of a big moment because as it turns out, of course, Gavin Solchuk would bless the big run on the next play, 20-plus yarder set Oklahoma up first and goal, and then Dylan Gabriel would score Oklahoma's first of many touchdowns and his first of multiple rushing touchdowns as well on the day there so that was an impactful sequence and then West Virginia gets the ball back so you know Oklahoma scores quickly there and you're thinking if you're a Mountaineer fan all right shoot out engaged here we go our offense just has to answer the call they did good on the first possession let's see what they do with this one and uh, West Virginia gets the ball back and you're wondering okay as long as we continue to do what we did on the opening drive you know we've done a good job staying ahead of the chains let's not get behind the chains here uh, and put ourselves in a bad situation West Virginia has a positive play on first down you're thinking okay we're in good spot you know second and seven second and eight not a ton of yards but not a negative yardage play we're okay and then only you know one of West Virginia's two penalties that occurred in the entire game happens and unfortunately this was probably the most impactful of those penalties in my opinion because West Virginia gets a false start here on this play and then puts them behind the chains so you got second and long West Virginia tries to run the football something that they struggle to do a little bit in this game and one of the main reasons I think Oklahoma dominated this football game is because they dominated in the trenches they showed that on that play forced a TFL put West Virginia into third and 12 obviously they're not going to convert that third and long against this Oklahoma defense and especially not on this Saturday night when Oklahoma was having the game that they were having so West Virginia is forced into their first of what would be five straight three and outs so not only do you not answer the call when it looks like a shootout's going to begin you relinquish momentum back to Oklahoma after you had it early up with the 7-0 lead uh the game 7-7 you have a chance to regain the lead regain the momentum instead you get your you know a costly penalty I know West Virginia did a good job not having a lot of penalties in this game, but that one uh, really did hurt you. And, it, you know, you look back at the story of this game, it's impactful because Oklahoma gets the ball back, takes the advantage that they would never relinquish in this game, and West Virginia would begin that string of five straight three and outs. It was absolutely killer in this contest for West Virginia. And, you know, play calling's been good this season. I think there may be some areas in this game you can question it. I'll talk about one of those here momentarily in my opinion but overall I think West Virginia just didn't execute some of these plays there were guys open we missed or just straight up didn't see so I don't think I put too much of this on the play calling for the offense for me I'm putting a lot of this on the offensive line I was very disappointed with their performance in this game and the defensive line as well because those are the two areas that we've been so happy with their performance you know for West Virginia this season and a big reason for our success at times and both of those were sorely dominated by Oklahoma in this game unfortunately and that's why the Sooners were able to dominate on the scoreboard as well so you got to hope West Virginia bounces back in the trenches over these final two weeks and I believe that they will but uh, man it was a rough night there for the offensive line and for the defensive line for the Mountaineers unfortunately but uh, the good thing that you can say I guess you know I'm trying to note some positives throughout here just to not be all negative throughout this episode and that is at least this team continues to be resilient and show that resolve that they've shown Throughout this season, they would continue to battle back even when they got down uh, big in this game and never quit fighting uh, throughout this. But before we get to the stat review of this game, there are a couple more sequences that I wanted to note that I thought were really impactful for West Virginia in this game when they were potentially still in this one and it wasn't out of reach and they could have stayed within striking distance and who knows, maybe made it a little bit different and make it come down to the wire there at the end instead of being the absolute blowout, the gut punch that we had to watch as Mountaineer fans. And one of those was... West Virginia, I mentioned the string of five straight three and outs, but within that, after the second straight three and out, um, West Virginia had a break actually sandwiched in between there. 
They get that second consecutive three and out. They're only down 14-7, so you know, still very much within the game. West Virginia punts the football, and Oklahoma muffs it, and West Virginia recovers. So you're getting the ball set up on the Oklahoma 35-yard line. You think you're in good shape to at least make this a 14-10 game, but West Virginia does absolutely nothing with it. It would be, the, of course, the third straight of what I said, those five straight three and outs. They only gain three yards on three plays during that sequence. So not only do you – not get anything out of it as far as a touchdown, you're at least thinking, okay, maybe we'll get a field goal. But when you only gain three yards, you set Michael Hayes up for, you know, a long field goal than, you know, you would like him to probably kick. You would like to get him a little bit closer there, be a little bit more comfortable with the attempt. But yet again, Michael Hayes, who had been so consistent for West Virginia coming into this game, 12 of 13 on the season. And it goes back to what I said to begin this episode, everything going wrong that could. He has his worst miss of the season here and doesn't convert. West Virginia gets no points off the turnover as Oklahoma would get the ball back and go down the field and convert it into points, scoring a field goal. So there you go, a big swing there in terms of points. And West Virginia, you know, had a chance to keep this one close, even tie the game potentially right there and does nothing with it when they got a break in this one. So, you know, everything that could go wrong did go wrong in terms of you get a break, you do nothing with it. Michael Hayes, who'd been so consistent, has his worst miss of the year. And you had other players have, you know, maybe their worst performances of the season as well. And, of course, the one that's going to stick out the most is uh, Garrett Green. We were hoping to see him really put on a show in this one. And unfortunately, it was Oklahoma quarterback Dylan Gabriel that did that, setting a school record for Oklahoma with eight touchdowns in this game. And, unfortunately, like I said, for West Virginia, everything that could go wrong did at the worst potential time. GG having his worst game of the season in this one unfortunately. So there's that sequence. And then there's one other sequence. Well, I, it's technically two more sequences, but I'm going to sandwich them together here because they both are kind of had the same principle for me in this game. And um, that's the thing that I talked about in this one, that West Virginia getting dominated in the trenches was a big reason that, you know, they were losing this game and look no further than these two sequences where West Virginia couldn't pick up a single yard. They couldn't get the push on Oklahoma to pick up a single yard. One coming early in the second quarter, Third and one, West Virginia only needs a yard, can't get any push whatsoever. Instead, they get a TFL there on third and one, push them back into fourth and two, which they wouldn't convert. That one wasn't on the offensive line. West Virginia went to the air. Uh, Garrett Green had a wide open. De Devin Carter actually and just didn't even see him uh, through to the shallow cross ahead instead, and it was incomplete. West Virginia turned it over on down the air. And then the other sequence that I want to talk about is probably one that you're more familiar with, and that is West Virginia getting the ball near the goal line, and the game was not out of reach at this point either. And here we go. First and goal, West Virginia has the ball. Three straight stops from the one-yard line for Oklahoma. Just unacceptable there for the Mountaineers to not be able to get one yard. And I mentioned, you know, maybe there's a sequence or two you could question play calling. For me, it was this sequence. Um, the o o Oklahoma defensive line obviously outplaying the West Virginia offensive line, yes. But West Virginia, you know, had tried, you know, two straight times to run it up the middle. Uh, didn't work. Maybe you try something to the outside. Instead, they fake it, try to go back up the middle with C.J. It's not there. They don't get in. Neil Brown mentioned he thought West Virginia maybe got in on one or two of those plays. They didn't have a goal line camera. That's a whole other issue I'm not going to talk about. My issue here when I'm questioning the play call in here, which is something I've not done a ton this season, I don't think needs to be done a ton this season because Neil Brown's done a great job. And even in this game, there were situations where guys were open. But like I said, there were some sequences. And for me, the reason I'm questioning this one is more so because something that we haven't seen in quite a few games, and I'm just wondering where it went to and why not. And that is in short yardage earlier in the season, we were going to a fullback as a lead blocker there. We brought in Luke Hamilton as a transfer. He was doing a great job of that earlier in the season. Then just all of a sudden, he's completely gone away from the offense. And in these short yardage situations, haven't seen him once, and I don't know how many weeks. So I'm just wondering, where's Luke Hamilton or Colin McBee? Someone in there to lead block for CJ or whoever's in the backfield on these plays that were running in these short yardage situations and near the goal line because that was working earlier in the year. So I don't know if you know Luke Hamilton suffered some type of injury and they're just not disclosing that, but we haven't seen him in many weeks. And in this game, West Virginia got stuffed. Two different scenarios. Mentioned the one earlier. And then, of course, this one on the goal line that was even more impactful when the game was still in reach. So I was just kind of thinking in my head, where's Luke Hamilton? Put him in there. Let him lead block like you did earlier in the season when you went under center in some of these goal line situations with some little bit of old school football and it was working for you. Seems like we've kind of gone away from that here in recent weeks and I don't know why, but nonetheless, 
West Virginia obviously doesn't score the touchdown there, turns the ball over, and it's continued to, you know, snowball effect everything negative that was happening in this game for the Mountaineers that ultimately got us to our 59 to 20 score there at the end of this one that dropped West Virginia to six and four overall on the season and four and three in Big 12 conference play with two games remaining on the year. And hopefully West Virginia, though, is able to secure wins there and still finish with a very positive eight and four record on the season here. But those are kind of my takeaways ways as some sequences that really affected the game and kind of the main reasons personally I felt West Virginia was dominated in this football game but let's take a quick look at the numbers here do a bit of a stat review team wise and individual wise before we take a look at the rest of the conferences games to wrap up episode 180 here of the Country Roads webcast for our Oklahoma review and reactions edition <laughs> All right, getting into the team stats here, and obviously this stat review is not going to be fun uh, through this episode, Mountaineer Nation, when West Virginia lost this game the way that they did, but we'll run through it as quickly as we can here. West Virginia, 17 first downs to 25 for Oklahoma. Third downs continue to be a problem for West Virginia. That's one area you can point to as an area that this offense really needs to continue to try and work on. Uh, third down efficiency has been an issue at times this evening. It, even when West Virginia has won the football game, uh, this game, it really came back to bite them. The fact that they were four of 16 on third downs, uh, two of four on fourth downs, Oklahoma, meanwhile, eight of 14 on third downs and two of two on their fourth down attempts. And that's pretty much a complete inverse of last year's game. One of the big reasons, and I talked about this in the preview show, West Virginia was able to win last year was they dominated on these conversion downs, really held Oklahoma in check. This year, Oklahoma flips the script and flips the script in the result of the game, obviously, as well. Total yardage, man. This one really hurts. 644 yards for Oklahoma to 330 for the Mountaineers. And the Mountaineers have been having nearly, you know, 500 yards per game here in their past four games. So not a great performance from them offensively and an even worse pot performance potentially defensively. We mentioned West Virginia. We need to have both of those areas play well together for, you know, one of the first times all season. We saw it finally happen against BYU. Couldn't replicate it in this one. Both of them having, you know, one of their worst games of the seasons, actually, especially on the defensive side. And moving on, obviously, probably GG's worst game of the year. You see 10 of 31 for the Mountaineers with him and Nico's numbers combined as Nico got into this one. Late yet again, 154 yards for the Mountaineers, 423 for the Sooners, only five yards per completion for WVU, 11.8 for Oklahoma, and WVU did throw the two interceptions. Oklahoma did not throw any. Um, Beanie Bishop nearly had one, though, had it in his hand, so it's another pass breakup for him, but couldn't secure the interception. West Virginia does end up with some decent rushing numbers um, here late, but they only average you know, the 4.3 yards per carry, 176 yards for the Mountaineers, so I guess, like I said, I'm going to continue to try and note positives throughout this. The streak of 140-yard-plus games rushing continues for the Mountaineers. You know, that dates back to, you know, the end of last season. So, at least you got that going for you. 221 yards rushing for Oklahoma, though. They really gashed WVU, especially Salchuk. Had over 100 yards rushing in the first half. Penalties, though. Tip your cap to West Virginia here. Were disciplined in that area, although I did mention the one there that I thought affected the game a little bit when you look back at it. But West Virginia still did a better job than Oklahoma. Only two penalties for the Mountaineers. Can't be too mad about that. When West Virginia has five penalties or less this season, it's typically been a positive result. Wasn't the case in this one, but that's a good formula to continue. Moving forward, West Virginia unfortunately loses the turnover battle. Two to one and time of possession. West Virginia just barely winning in this one. And you see that's another reason they were dominated in this game. West Virginia has done a good job this season being very high, you know, plus margin in time of possession, obviously, usually 10 minutes or more. In this one, they only win by one minute, 30 to 29 over the Sooners. And you can look at those sequences of those three and outs. West Virginia had those five straight there throughout the first and second quarter. One reason why they were not able to, you know, have a better time of possession rate in this football game. That's a look at the team statistics in this one. Let's take a look at the individual numbers. Not too many highlights here, so I won't spend too much time talking about it. I think we've Ran through it pretty thoroughly here at this point. Uh, GG, 10 of 27, 154, two TDs and an INT. Bad day for him. Worst game of the season for him and probably the worst game of the season for Nico as well. I know he's coming in there in spot duty, so you don't want to judge that too much. But 0 of 4 with an interception, not the best look there. Uh, Rushing-wise, CJ, 14 carries, 79 yards and one touchdown. And I think the thing that I failed to mention, and I apologize for that, and it's something that's probably – 
kind of flying under the radar, obviously, with everyone so upset with the loss, and that is the injury to CJ. We can't forget to you know mention that and pray that he's okay and send prayers out to CJ, thoughts, well wishes, however you want to term it there. Uh, but looked like another ankle injury for him, unfortunately, for the second straight season. Hopefully it's not a long-term thing that's going to keep him out for these final two games, but you have to be ready to deal with that possibility, and we'll probably learn a little bit about that in Neil Brown's press conference today and get an update on that later in the week here on the Country Roads webcast. But sending positive thoughts out to CJ as he hopefully recovers from that injury he suffered there late in the game as he didn't finish the contest. Jaheim White did. Um, we'll see if he steps into the starting role if CJ is unable to go. Not the best game for him. First game he's really been bottled up in his career. Nine carries, 39 yards for him. Ten carries for 24 yards for Garrett Green. Same goes for him. Three carries for 13 ju for Justin Johnson late in this one. Nico Marchio, two carries for 10 yards. Then you get a carry for EJ Horton for four, a carry for Rodney Gallagher for four, and Preston Fox with the one carry for three yards, which actually netted West Virginia a first down on a fourth down run uh, with that three-yard run that Preston Fox had. Receivers. Devin Carter, three catches, 67 yards, and a touchdown to lead the Mountaineers. Traylon Ray, I thought, played well. Two catches, 56 yards, and nearly had another one in the corner of the end zone. Just had his toe on the line of the out-of-bounds marker there. Had the rest of his foot in the end zone. Just, you know, if it was an inch or two uh, back, it was a touchdown. But it was a great catch, and I think that he's continuing to look better and better. Uh, two catches for Preston Fox for 15 yards. One catch for 13 yards for Hudson Clement. I definitely don't believe he's quite 100% yet. We didn't see him a ton, but West Virginia went to him there in that late drive in the second quarter when they scored just before half. He caught that pass for a 13-yard gain. Also nearly had a catch in the end zone, but was interfered with, and that set up Cole Taylor's one catch right there before half that you see there, netting three yards and the touchdown. And then C.J. Donaldson, one catch for zero yards. West Virginia defensive-wise, not too many positives to talk through here. If you're watching on the video side, I'll kind of scroll through these so you can see the numbers, but I won't shout out too many of them. I know West Virginia did have a sack or two in this game, uh, one I think from Sean Martin. Uh, the other one I want to say from Jalen Thornton, if I'm not mistaken. Those were kind of the highlights to me uh, just off the top of my head. But, you know, as I mentioned the video version, I want to take a second and say appreciate you guys watching the episode. Um, if you're doing that on the video version, you can find it on YouTube, your Country Roads webcast, or on the web there, wvsportsnow.com. If you're tuning into that version, hit the like button. Be sure to subscribe to us here. If you're tuning into the audio version, though, we appreciate that as well. You can find it on any podcast platform you like. Leave us a rating and review on that side. It helps us. And be sure to share us around with other Mountaineer fans that you may know. But standout numbers for the defense, really. I mean, Anthony Wilson led the team in tackles with 11. Um, Hershey McLaurin, good game with nine tackles. Beanie Bishop, eight, eight tackles, seven of those solo. Had another pass breakup or two as well. Mentioned the sack for Sean Martin. He had a TFL as well. Uh, Jalen Thornton had two TFLs to go with his one sack. He's really coming on here in the past couple of weeks, liking to see his performance. But overall, not very positive uh, results for the defense, obviously, in this game. Their worst game of the season by far, and they're going to have to improve and bounce back from this one if they want to have success over these final two games. All right, Mountaineer Nation. So that's all I got in terms of this 59-20 to loss for West Virginia in Game 10 of the Mountaineers season here in Week 11 of the college football season. West Virginia drops to 6-4 and four overall and 4-3 and three in Big 12 play. But speaking of Big 12 play, let's take a look around the conference at some of the other games that occurred over the weekend talk about some of those results here as we get set to wrap up our Oklahoma review and reaction episode here on the Country Roads webcast. All right, Mountaineer Nation, we've reached our final segment here on episode 180 around the Big 12. Going to recap this weekend's results around the conference here in uh, week 11. And uh, we actually had some Pretty close games and some surprising results. A couple of upsets mixed in here as well. And we're leading off with one of those. Texas Tech heading to Lawrence and really surprising Kansas in this one. They were up, you know, 10-0 for a lot of this game. Kansas battles back, makes it close late. And shout out to them for doing that because they lost Jason Bean in this football game. We're playing a freshman there at quarterback, battled back, made it interesting late. But Texas Tech, you know, with a big road win there when a lot of people were certainly not expecting them to go down there and beat Kansas the way that they did. 
They do just that, though, and surprise everyone. 16-13 to 13 over the Jayhawks there in Lawrence. And then Baylor, Kansas State, kind of a finish that more along the lines of what we were expecting in this one. And one of the few games that was not a surprise uh, this weekend, I guess you could say, Kansas State dominating the Baylor Bears who are really struggling this season, arguably uh, the worst team in the Big 12 this year, uh, falling pretty far from their Big 12 title. A couple of years ago, they go into Manhattan and get dominated. Kansas State puts up 59 points on them, so West Virginia not the only Big 12 team to give up 59 points in a conference game this week. I guess we can at least say that. Uh, Baylor losing to Kansas State 59-25. to And this one right here, the most surprising result of the week, an absolute shocker. You know, I think in the preview show in our Around the Big 12 segment, I was questioning the line a little bit, wondering why UCF was, you know, so close um, in terms of the spread to Oklahoma State. I think Oklahoma State was only favored by two and a half going into this game. And I'm wondering, you know, UCF, their run defense is bid and bad. Oklahoma State, they have Ollie Gordon, one of the best running backs in the nation. What gives? Uh, but it goes to show you, Vegas just always knows, man. Sometimes they, they know stuff that you don't, and they certainly knew something that I didn't with this one. Not only was that spread pick correct, it was more than correct. Look at UCF, 45-3 to over Oklahoma State, who we thought was well on their way to a Big 12 title game. Now that's a little bit in question, and things have gotten mixed up with that conference title race here a bit as UCF surprises everyone not only you know keeps it close with Oklahoma State, but absolutely dominates the Cowboys there at the bounce house. And I guess now this is the first time that we as Big 12 fans get to see what people talk about with that tough environment of the bounce house uh, firsthand here as Oklahoma State was dominated. I watched a good bit of this one, at least in the first half, till it got, you know, looked like it was too far out of reach. And then I switched to another game. But Oklahoma State, man, you know, Talked about West Virginia, everything that could go wrong will. Um, same thing goes there for Oklahoma State. UCF's best performance of the season by far, and maybe they're hitting their stride here at the right time to close their season as well. 45-3, to the shocker of the week in the Big 12 Conference. Obviously, we've went through the Mountaineers result enough. We don't want to talk any more about that than we have to. But we can talk about West Virginia's next opponent. That will be Cincinnati that they're facing this week. They're coming off a victory over Houston on the road, going in there, beating the fighting Dana Holgersons by 10 points, 24 to 14. So you see they're holding Dana Holgerson offense to 14 points. That's the thing about Cincinnati that West Virginia is going to have to worry about this week is Cincinnati has shown at times that they have a good defense, and more importantly, they have some really big guys on their defensive line, and their defensive line has been good this year. We talked about West Virginia having a struggle in the trenches this week. They're going to have their work cut out for them to bounce back, and hopefully West Virginia's offense comes out and really shows us something. As Cincinnati's coming off a win, West Virginia's coming off a loss. The Bearcats going in there to Houston and getting a road win. Good win there for Cincinnati over over Houston. And then the nightcap, of course, we mentioned Iowa State heading to Provo. Wondered if that would have an effect on them. It definitely did not there. The late kick has no effect. Iowa State rolls over BYU, who unfortunately continues to struggle. They're dealing with the injuries that they're dealing with and just having a rough go right now. 45-13, to 13, the Cyclones beat the Cougars. And then finally, our game of the week this week in our Around the Big 12 segment here on the CRW podcast was Texas versus TCU. And this one actually ended up being pretty close. And I think another one that was surprising that it ended up being as close as it did. But Texas able to, you know, ultimately come out on the winning side of things and continue to ride their positive wave that looks like will carry them all the way to the conference title, barring any other major surprises, but you never know what could happen now after this week that we've seen uh, a lot more crazy things could happen over these final couple of weeks as we continue to see how this conference title race will shake out. But Texas certainly will be a part of it. Quinn Ewers comes back and they beat TCU 29-26. But it's going to be fun to talk about uh, this Big 12 conference title race over these final two weeks of the season. And we're excited to do it here on our final segment here on these episodes always as we cover it here talking around the Big 12. (laughs) 
All right, Mountaineer Nation. So there you have it. That will pretty much wrap us up here on episode 180 of the CRW podcast. Appreciate you guys tuning into this one, whether you're tuned into the video version or the audio version. We appreciate you taking it in any way that you choose to do so um, on our YouTube channel, Country Roads Webcast. They're on the web at wvsportsnow.com where you'll find all kinds of great Mountaineer sports content that you should already be checking out. If you're not already, then you're missing out. And then on the audio side, of course, you can find it on any podcast platform, Google. Google, Apple, Spotify, Amazon, iHeartRadio, you name it, just search Country Roads Webcast. Leave us a rating and review there. That helps us out a lot. Um, if you don't know when our episodes are releasing, you can always find that out by following us on social media at WVU Country Roads on X, Country Roads Webcast on Facebook and Instagram there. Shared my thoughts on this game with you guys, but I'm pretty sure that you guys have plenty of your own as well, and I'd love to hear some of those. Share them in the comments there with us. We appreciate those interactions as we continue to try and grow the Country Roads Webcast community throughout Mountaineer Nation, but glad to get this episode out of the way so we can kind of put this game behind us now and look ahead to hopefully more positive results over these final two contests and we can get to an eight-win season. That would be fun to say for us here throughout Mountaineer Nation, wouldn't it? But, you know, not a great result for West Virginia in this one, but hopefully, you know, it's something they can learn from and grow from moving forward. That's what we're hoping for. Know you all are hoping for the same there as well. We'll continue to cover it here on the CRW podcast. Look for our Cincinnati preview episode releasing later this week and hope you guys tune into that one and hope you've enjoyed this episode as well. As always, I'm Jordan Cruz. And until next time, let's go Mountaineer. If you really want to know, then come on, let's go. Take a stroll down those...